Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tune Under podcast. It's the Southern Hemisphere's biggest, best podcast for all things Newcastle United. I'm Jack in Brisbane. Uh, we are here to preview the game against West Ham, which is coming up in about five days' time. It's the Monday night game in the UK, Tuesday morning in Australia. And with me to help with this is West Ham fan with a really good name, James Jones. That's a, a definitely a good name. Um, <laughs> James, thanks for coming on. Thank you for your time. What, who are you and what's your story with West Ham United? Uh, well, firstly, Jack, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on. Um, so, I, yeah, we, I've, I've on the We Are West Ham podcast, uh, co-host of that. Um, been a West Ham fan all my life. Um, ever since my dad said, if you ever come home from school and tell me you're a Tottenham fan, you'll be homeless. <laughs> Um, and I was about five at the time, so that kind of scared me into it. Um, I'm glad he did in the end because, you know, uh, I wouldn't have had the joy of the last four years. And to be fair, the last four years have been probably the best four years of my entire life as a West Ham fan because it's been it's been glorious. But um, like Newcastle uh, fans, have, I've had to go through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and a lot of frustration and anger along the way. But it's worth the wait in the end. But, um, but yeah, season ticket holder for 25 well, probably coming up to 30 years now. Um, so, yeah, it's it's in my blood. Um, and love now being able to talk about it on a weekly basis to to an audience. So, so yeah. How does it work then with L- the London clubs? Because obviously you've got, there's a lot of Premier League clubs. So there's a lot of competition for fans and where they're going to pull. So is it mainly, like you said, kind of like family connections um, with a, a club like West Ham? Or is it where you were brought up? Or how does it sort of work in that sense? I think I think it's a mixture of uh, where you're brought up and family connections. I mean, where I grew up on on the outskirts of Essex and sort of North East London, um, a lot of West Ham there, but then there's also a lot of Arsenal, a lot of Tottenham. Um, so, it when it comes to where I grew up, it was mostly sort of through family connections. You know, you basically supported your dad supported. Um, I do know a few outliers on that where some of my mates support a different team to their dad does. Um, makes Christmas dinner a little bit awkward sometimes, I'm <laughs> sure. But um but yeah, I it, it's there's so many London clubs, you know, even if you go into the championship and you've got Millwall and you've got um, you know, even some of the smaller clubs like Palace and Brentford and Fulham and um so there's so many clubs. Leighton Orient is another one. Um so but yeah it's it's just, you know, you basically support who your dad supports nine times out of ten. Um I do know one mate who was a grew up a West Ham fan and then um it was when the Chelsea takeover happened with Abramovich and he's now a diehard Chelsea fan, still is to this day. And I remember taking him to West Ham when I had a free season ticket when we were in like year eight or year nine at school and he loved every minute of it. He was a West Ham fan. He wore a West Ham shirt that day and now he's a Chelsea mm-hmm. fan. So you do get the odd one that will change and be a bit of a glory hunter. Um, but that's not me. No, no. We um, we spoke to a guy, a West Ham fan from Australia uh, a couple of years ago now, and he's got he's of Greek heritage and um, he just decided to start supporting West Ham from Melbourne. It was a fantastic story, yeah. And uh, a couple of our podcast um, lads as well, Newcastle fans, just sort of picked a club and went with it. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I think it's, it's you know, you got to give respect to people like that who who follow a club that never win anything. <laughs> 100%. It's I mean, easier it's to support Man City or Chelsea, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's rare to find fans that just go, oh, I'm going to support them. I'm, I'm, it's going to be difficult. Um, and there's probably fans of that club going, don't bother, mate. It's not worth your time. You're better off going for the bigger club. But but yeah, I've got a lot, a lot of respect for fans like that. Yeah, it's great, yeah. So you've touched on West Ham's recent success a little bit there. They've sort of yo-yoed a bit in the early 2000s, but have been a Premier League fixture, I think, since 2012. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously won the first European trophy in 2023. West Ham have tried to bridge that gap to the top six or seven a few times. I think that they've found it difficult to do that. So where are West Ham as a club right now in, in that sense? That's such a great question. Um, I think... If you take the start of this season out of it, I think, um, because it has been a bit of an outlier, um, we we are fine, like we're primed to be a club that can bridge that gap and probably should do when you factor in, you know, the the, the club's finances. I think we're we're in the top 20 richest clubs in the world. Um, You know, uh, our revenue is, I think we're we're going to in the next month um, post record revenues of 350 million quid. The stadium has made that possible. If you look at the stadium, I know we'll probably end up touching on that a little bit later, but um, yeah. it's okay, it's not a football stadium, but it holds 66,000 people. 
so it takes in a decent amount of revenue as well. So the club's not poor. It's got a lot of money. It's shown that in the, in the transfer uh, recruitment over the last five or six years. Um, and the quality of players that we're now able to attract, and I think probably our location in London helps as well. Um, a lot of players from abroad want to come and play in London. Um, so we are like primed to be that one of those clubs that can bridge the gap. Um, but our problem is that it's consistently doing it. And it's probably not just our problem. It's every other club that is primed to bridge that gap, such as Newcastle, such as Villa. You know, it's once you get there, it's then sustaining it and then remaining there. Um, Tottenham mm-hmm. are probably the only club that have managed to do that without heavy, heavy, heavy investment like Man City did. Um, you know, Tottenham were a mid-table club up until, you know, 2010, 20, 2008 yeah. maybe. Um, and now they're regularly battling for the top four. And that's kind of where we f- we feel like we can get to. Not that we should be there, but we can get there. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that probably need to happen, such as an ownership change being that bring the being the primary one that for us to in, make that a more sustainable journey for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to touch on the owners in a minute as well, but how have West Ham gone with PSR stuff? You know, there's that's been in the in the news a lot. And I know that they benefited from selling Declan Rice, who was classed as homegrown, and then the, the money all can go back into the into the team and into the club. But West Ham seem to have avoided some of the PSR problems that clubs like Newcastle, um, Everton, Villa have, have got, got themselves into. So how how's that been possible for West Ham? Um, I think I think a lot of it, the Declan Rice thing recently would have helped massively. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to post record record revenues in the next month or so uh, over the last year. Um, you know, 100, 105 million pounds of cold, hard profit is, isn't bad. Um, but I think gen- generally we've we've done pretty well with our wage with our wage structure. Our wage structure, when you know, maybe not even five or six years ago, was a complete shambles, and it still is in in some areas. But it's sustainable. You know, there is a structure there. You know, if we ignore the fact that Danny Ings is the second highest paid player in the squad at 125 grand a week, um, other than that. No one's earning more than they should do. You know, th- there is a structure there and, you know, there's no, there's not too many players over 100 grand a week and it's, you know, it's relatively good. So that obviously helps. Um, but we've been better at selling players recently as well. Um, there was a time not long ago before Moyes came where we we just really struggled to sell players um, for good money. I mean, you know, like we'd, we'd buy a player for... For 30 million quid and then he'd end up being sold two years later for 8 million quid and things like that and it's just like what's going on here like, you know it's it's not sustainable um so we have been much better in that in that respect um but the for all the fault i've got for the owners um financially the club is run very very well these days and i think they've got you know yeah. they've got a really tight grip on um everything that goes in and out of the club um we're not reckless with our spending um, and I think that's helped us kind of stay on the right side of the, of the law where PSR is concerned. Yeah, and it's good to avoid that stress because we had a, a really bad um, time in June when we had to end up selling players. And it's like, how yeah. can the how can this club that's owned by the, the sovereign wealth fund of Saudi Arabia end up getting in this situation where we have to yeah. scramble to sell our best young players? So, yeah, it's um, it's interesting, and we've actually. With Mike Ashley as well, it's really interesting what you said there about the owners running the club sustainably because Mike Ashley had so many faults in terms of the ambition and what he used the club for as an advertising vehicle for his sports shop, but he ran the club sustainably as well. And that's why we were in a position where when we had to take over, we were able to spend all that money in a couple, yeah. of, couple of seasons and we spent it well. So that's what, how we progressed so quickly. But the, the West Ham ownership, so I know that David Gold, who was the co-owner, he he died a few years ago, and I read yeah. that his daughter Vanessa owns around a 25% stake in the club now, along mm-hmm. with David Sullivan, who's got 39%, Daniel Kretinsky, he's got 27%. So I, I see a lot of criticism um, aimed at David Sullivan from fans, and I know that you actually hit back a bit at that lately. I saw your, your clip on Twitter where you were saying that that's maybe not justified, so... How does the ownership structure work and, and does it work for West Ham at the moment? Well, D- David Sullivan's the one that calls all the shots. He's the majority shareholder. Um, and he's the one that gets a lot of the stick. Um, and nine times out of ten, rightly so. You know, he's one of the main guys behind the stadium move. Um, 
and the lies that were behind that stadium move um and then the aftermath of it um he's you know he has been criticized in the past for for being a little bit tight not wanting to spend the money but you can't really say that recently you know he has spent i think for the last four or five summers we spent over 100 million pound every summer minimum um on players you know whether that recruitment is has been good or not is completely irrelevant the fact is he spent the money um so yeah he deserves a lot of stick um but he and he's the one that calls the shots the fact is is that he's also very very susceptible to bowing down to fan pressure um and sometimes that can be a problem as well and a lot of west ham fans will completely disagree with me because a lot of west ham fans think that only they can be right and no one else can no um but the fact is is that you know he bowed down to the pressure of um not giving Moyes a new contract last year um and had to go and get get another manager because that's what the fans wanted now now he's being blamed for appointing the wrong manager so i kind of have a little bit of you know maybe not i don't feel sorry for the guy but i'm you know i'm aware of the fact that sometimes you know sometimes it's not always his fault um, and the situation we're in now, I do not believe is solely his fault. Yes, he appointed the manager. The manager hasn't worked out. That's fine. It happens all the time at football clubs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the long term, the fans want him gone. We, we wanted him to sell up for, for many years, even before the stadium move. We wanted him out. Um, um, obviously, the involvement of Cameron Brady as well. You know, that hasn't, you know, fans don't really like that. Um, and you know, recently you mentioned Daniel Kotinski with 27%. He that that um investment came in during COVID, I think, and it was a strategic investment. I think if you buy 29% of the club, you're seen by the Premier League as being a majority shareholder, it would have been okay. seen as a takeover. So he bought 27% of the club. Um, now Kotinski is the richest man in Czech Republic, he's worth something like 12 billion, um, mm-hmm. owns. Uh, I think he's the majority owner of Royal Mail, owns a lot of Sainsbury's. Um, he's, you know, he's a big, very, very shrewd businessman. Um, and the fans are like, come on, Daniel, dig deep, you know, yeah. let's, let's go for it. And I think his wealth has grown by like six billion in the last 12 months. So the fans are like, come on, mate, like, let's buy that extra few percent. Um, but he's said, you know, I, I, I'm going to be a silent shareholder. I just wanted to invest in the football club. He owns Slavia Prague as well. So if he wants to buy West Ham, he'll have to sell Slavia Prague, no doubt. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, the ownership will always come under because of what's happened before with the stadium move and everything else. And the ownership will always get the brunt of all the flat from the fans. The trouble yeah. is that there's a lot of fans out there, and it's going to you mentioned my clip. There's a lot of fans out there that will not have a good word to say about David Sullivan. Mm-hmm. You know, we could go and win the Premier League, and David Sullivan will not get any of the credit for it. And it's and it's ridiculous because you know he's the owner of the football club. Surely he should get some credit for if West Ham went and won the Premier League. But you know, and uh, during the David Moyes era, um, he people forgot David Sullivan was even there because it was going really well. The moment it starts, there's yeah. any sign of any unrest or things go badly, straight away the finger goes back on David Moyes, and I just don't think it's right. Um, you know, he, he has his faults. He's done really bad things, and, he, and we want I want him to sell the club. But to blame him at the moment for anything bad, it's just, I don't agree with it. Yeah. Do, do you think that, you mentioned that Daniel Kotinski is worth about 12 billion. Do you think in the Premier League now that that's that's enough? Do you think he's rich enough to be able to push the club on to where, because, you know, we talked, we touched on the PSR stuff. So like they, they, they're restricted anyway, what we can spend. But Mike actually, when he sold Newcastle, he said, and he, he, I think he's only one, one or two billion. But he just said, "I've got nowhere near enough money to be able to, you know, sustain, return this club into a Champions League fighting club." Mm. So, uh, do you think Kratinsky, if he did do that, if he had enough, or do you have to get people in place who were going to make good business decisions and good football decisions and things like that? I think you know, it, it's it's difficult because you know when you've got clubs like Newcastle, Man City, and the wealth that they've got, you go, "Well, twelve billion quid's a drop in the ocean for for those owners." So, no, is it enough? No. Um, but what you just said there, you know, if you've got the right people running the club proper football people that know how to run a football club sustainably um, and successfully, then you've got half a chance. You know, David Sullivan's a billionaire in his own right. Um, 
but the trouble is when we when we talk figures like you know oh that person's worth 12 billion a lot of that isn't that's not cash in the bank you know that's yeah. you know the shares in businesses and assets, you know property yeah. and, and you know assets um so yeah he's worth 12 billion or, or there or thereabouts but you know you know how much can he realistically pump into the club no one really knows um, so you need the right people behind the scenes running the club well. Um, and that's where David Sullivan falls down a little bit is that, you know, he has been criticised for the way he's run the club in the past. Recently, he's, um, he's employed a technical director, Tim Stiton, to to kind mm. of do a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of that decision making. But ultimately, the final decision still goes through David Sullivan yeah. and would still go through da- Daniel Kutinsky. Um, So, yeah, I mean, 12 billion quid, is it enough? Not in Not in today's game. But it's a start. It's eleven million more than David Sullivan. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talked about him listening to fan what the fans say. I hope he's not on Twitter because you know it's just like if you're going to go on there and sort of. I suppose the atmosphere at the game is at the games as well will impact him, won't it? I remember that it was a game against Burnley. I think yeah. it was a few years yeah. ago, where like it, but it was before it was in Moyes' first spell. I think wasn't it? And it was it was so it looked so toxic and just absolutely awful. And yeah, that, so is that is that is that the sort of thing you're talking about where you're sort of like you can't you can't ignore that I suppose, but in terms of the fan pressure and the, the general sort of match going atmosphere and the match going fans, that's what you're talking about. You'll you'll pay attention to that and make decisions based on that. Yeah, I mean, well, to your first one, he's not on Twitter, but his son is, um, and that's had its controversial moments. Um, you know, there was a time very early in after he bought the club, you know, and his, his son Jack commenting and having ne- negative comments on signing players that we were linked to signing. And there was one player we signed, I can't remember for the life of me who it was, but like the day we signed, um, his son tweeted, oh my God, I can't believe it, or something like that. And then he had to public- publicly apologise to the player that we signed. Absolute circus. <laughs> Um, but that Burnley game you mentioned, you know, that was the, the, the probably the darkest day in the club's modern history because you know, the fans were still reeling after the stadium move. We were told that, that stadium move that would be a world class stadium for a world class team and would be fighting for Europe. And um, within, you know, the, and we just qualified for Europe the last season at Upton Park. You know, we finished seventh, qualified for Europe. Great, unbelievable season that. Um, and then it all just fell apart very quickly. And, um, we were in a relegation battle in our first three seasons at the new stadium, and everyone's just like, "This is ridiculous! This is what we didn't sign up for this." Mm. Um, and then it all came to a head with that with that Burnley game. We're only three 0 down at home to Burnley. I mean, it's just it's not good. So um, yeah, and the fans just had enough. And you know, I don't really agree with the way that the fans behaved that day, but I understand the frustration. And it all went on David Sullivan, David Gold, and Karen Brady on that day. And um, you know. Since then, we've slowly, and they've slowly started listening to fans a little bit more, and things have started, you know, going right. Um, but back then, they weren't listening to fans, and they were going against what fans wanted, like the stadium. Mm-hmm. That and um, that game reminded me of a game at Newcastle when Ke- Kevin Keegan had left the, in his second spell, and the atmosphere was just pure poison in the stadium. And it, Joe Kinnear was there and it was just absolutely toxic and yeah. we we lost a full city and it was just and that that actually reminded me about that that sort of when when a home stadium just totally turns on on yeah. the owners and everyone's just in a, a really like you know a, a forceful aggressive mood and it's just mm-hmm. everything comes together doesn't it yeah let's let's talk about the stadium you've you've mentioned it a few times there I, I did want to want to ask you about it because Newcastle are looking to either build a new stadium or expand St James's Park, increase the capacity so that we can compete financially with, you know, the bigger clubs. We can get more corporates in because that's what football's about these days and that's how yeah. you get your money in. West Ham have got the lease on the London Stadium. It hasn't, um, like you said before, it's not a football stadium. It was in, it was built as the, the Olympic Olympic Stadium. So you've, I know what you're going to say to this, but West, Ham, do you think it's been harmful to West Ham in total, like you know, in the long run, or is it more to do with sort of leaving Upton Park, which was such a febrile sort of atmospheric old stadium? What's the sort of general feeling about this? Because you, you've you've mentioned it a few times already. It's it's it looks like a real cautionary tale for a club like Newcastle who might be looking to move move away from our spiritual home you know forever for 125 years yeah how's it gone for west ham and what's the general consensus 
Well, I have I've mixed feelings on the stadium. Um, as a match day experience, match day experience has improved. Those first couple of years was woeful. Over the years, they've improved the, the infrastructure, the match day facilities, uh, the match day experience on, uh, as a whole. And so, I don't really mind going there anymore. Um, the first couple of years, it was, a, it was a difficult to drag myself out of bed and go every Saturday afternoon. Um, it's not a football stadium. We know that. Has it affected us? For the first one or two years, I would have said, yeah, it has. It takes time to get used to your new surroundings. And it's a whole different experience for the players as well, I'm sure, because the fans are further away. And, you know, um, you know, the sound, the way this way it's built the sound doesn't really stay in the stadium as well as it does in in other grounds and um but i wouldn't say that it's negatively affected us long term i mean if it you know we wouldn't have had the four years under the moyes that we had if it, if you know if the stadium was at fault so but you know the the main thing with the fans is that you know yeah we we were told that we would move be moving to world class stadium away from our spiritual home in upton park um and what we got was uh, an athletic stadium repurposed into a football stadium uh, with a lower tier built on scaffolding, um, which is still the case, by the way. Um, you can't tell, but it's still built on scaffolding, the lower tier. And um, and it's just not Upton Park. It's not a world-class yeah. stadium. Um, and that's been a frustration for fans. you know. And, and then, what, a few years later, Tottenham go and rebuild White Hart Lane, just around the corner. And they've got a stadium that literally every single person, me included, has gone to and gone, this is incredible. What a stadium this is. And people turn up at London Stadium and go, well, this is not a very nice stadium at all. It's a terrible match day yeah. experience. You're miles away from the pitch, et cetera, et cetera. So we feel like we've been sold a dream a little bit um, and, and instead got a nightmare. Um, but it does feel a lot more like home now. It's worth pointing that out. You know, I, I said from the very beginning, when we were in those relegation battles in the first couple of years, it's not going to feel like home until we start winning football matches here and start creating mm. memories. And then you start, you know, start getting a bit nostalgic of certain games and, and you know, being at the stadium. And over the last four or five years, we've had that. You know, we've had some incredible European nights, beating Sevilla, um, you know, almost beating Leverkusen last season, mm. um, being the first team to do it. it came so close and they got an 89th minute winner against, against us. And, um, you know, it... We've had some unbelievable nights beating Tottenham a number of times there, which is what most West Ham fans live for these days. It's just as long as we beat Tottenham, it doesn't matter. Um, beating Arsenal, beating Chelsea, beating Man United, beating City on penalties, which is rare. Um, so we've had some good memories there, and that's made it feel a lot more at home now. But And of course, it will never be Upton Park. Just like if if, if Newcastle build a new stadium, whatever it, whatever it is, it will mm. never be St. James's Park. It would never be the old St. James's Park. But I think, you know, you mentioned a cautionary tale. As long as you build an actual football stadium from scratch, mm. I think you'll be all right long term. Yeah. Our main problem is it's an athletic stadium. Yeah. That's and you it. can still, and that's still obvious, is it, to tell not just from the distance from the pitch, but just the whole sort of feel around the stadium. You yeah. can tell it's, an, it's built for athletics. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, don't get me wrong, we got a great deal financially. You know, the rent, I think it's two and a half million pounds a year in rent. Um, and if we we're in mm. Europe, we pay three and a half million quid. I mean, it's a drop in the ocean. A lot of people slag the club off for that. And it's like, well, if someone gave you the, the, the opportunity to um, to rent a car for a tenner a month, you'd take it, wouldn't you, really? Like, come on. Um, so like, we've had it, but our, our proposal when we were tr first trying to get it was to knock it down and rebuild it. Yeah. And the government said, no, we're only renting it out. And the only reason why the government said no is because Tottenham threw their toys out of the pram and had a moan about it. So, no, we don't mm. want our rivals having the brand new stadium. Mm. Um, so it's really Tottenham's fault, to be fair, that we're now <laughs> renting it and, and fleecing the taxpayer as a result. Um, but, yeah, it's if, if we – there have been some rumours that the, the government want to sell it. They want to get rid mm. of it. They're hemorrhaging money. I think the government's losing £30 million a year on it. Um, and, obviously, the taxpayer's picking that up. So they're going to want to get rid of that soon. And there has been some rumours that as part of the, whenever David Sullivan decides to sell the club, it will involve purchasing the stadium from the government oh, as yeah. well. Um, and uh, and then that will probably then mean knocking it down, rebuilding it. And, and then finally we'll have a, a world-class stadium for a world-class yeah. team, hopefully. But whether that comes <laughs> to fruition or not, I don't know. 
I remember was it Barry Hearn at Leighton Orient was kicking up a fuss as well. Oh, he like, kicked what, off. What yeah. Leighton Orient going to do with the stadium? For that well, side? yeah, <laughs> I, I, I felt a little bit sorry for Barry Hearn because you know Leighton Orient being the small, well, pretty much the smallest club in London, um, two two uh, tube stops away from Stratford yeah. is Leighton. So, um, and he would have seen it going. Well, hang on, on a match day. Like you've got your, you've, you know, you're going to be taking fans away from us. Essentially, mm, yeah. um, we need that. You know, we need to be the only club in this vicinity. And now we're not going to be. And our neighbours are going to be a big London Premier League football club. Um, so I understood his the reason why he kicked off, um, but it hasn't really affected them. To be fair, yeah. Um, so yeah, but I understood it. The um about the stadium. I remember Andy Carroll's overhead kick bicycle kick against West Ham that was my, that was the first time I remember looking at that stadium and thinking wow it's actually an atmosphere there because he's yeah. such a good goal and I think that was just when maybe just when Moyes came in and things were picking up a bit and it was yeah. looking, looking a bit better but that was a, yeah. I remember that was the first time I looked at that and thought that's actually a decent noise in that stadium <laughs> yeah I mean trust me the, the, when that night when that stadium gets going it can be a really really loud atmosphere like a really like jump in uh, atmosphere um it just took a while for that to for that to happen you know it took a while for the team to start winning games and scoring goals like Andy Carroll's there for the fans to have a reason to to make the the stadium loud um but we've had so many nights like that now so many results so many great memorable goals um memorable performances that you know now I've lost there's a lost count of how many times I've left that stadium going what a night that was or what a day that was that was brilliant yeah. um Whereas the first couple of years, I could count on one hand how many times I left the stadium <laughs> smiling. Um, so you know, it, it, you know, it, it, it was always going to take time. But I feel like we're there, there or thereabouts with it. Yeah, let's touch on David Moyes for a minute then. Football, you know, the football public can have skewed opinions about other clubs. So I always really like to get into you know insights from supporters of clubs who who this actually impacts. David Moyes left in the summer again, and there was a lot of "be careful what you wish for" type of commentary from the the usual suspects going on. On the face of it, Moyes was successful statistically. He was he's the most successful manager in West Ham's modern history, isn't he? So there was that concern about the style of play, though, um, mm-hmm. which is always going to sort of dog a manager like David Moyes. Newcastle, we've seen firsthand a couple of really bad performances from West Ham, big collapses. So, what what are your thoughts on Moyes and you know the decision? You've you've explained a little bit about the fact that it was fan pressure. So it was it was very much uh, West Ham fans were sick of David Moyes in the style of play, or was it more that the the manager the, the owner wanted to go a different direction, or what's and what's Moyes standing now among West Ham fans having? Having won that trophy and and brought success. Well, I think first and foremost, I want to say that I absolutely love that man with every fire of my being. Like what he's given me over the last few years, I thought it was a pipe dream for me before he before he arrived at the club. You know, West, seeing West Ham three years in Europe and winning a European trophy it was like, yeah. I mean, I was convinced I'd see West Ham win at least one trophy in my life, but I never, I never ever even considered it being a European one. Um. So I love him, and he did an unbelievable job in a very difficult situation. Uh, a club that is a lot of pressure because of a lot of the stuff we've already spoken about, um, and he delivered, and he delivered beyond anyone's wildest expectations. Um, but last year, even the season that we won the Conference League, there were signs that think that there were cracks appearing. Um, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Um, there were signs appearing that um, things weren't quite going well form-wise. You know, the year that we won the Conference League, we finished fourteenth, I think it was. Um, so I said after the day after we won the cup, I said uh, he should he should resign now. He should resign. Yeah. You know. Uh, die the hero will live long enough to become the villain and that's exactly the exact words I said and um, he stayed and I was like okay fine he stays you know, he deserves his rights into his last year of his contract he deserves the right to stay look what he's done for us and we had the best start to a Premier League season we've ever had in our entire history 
and then the moment it hit New Year, it all went downhill again. It was exactly the same yeah. as the season before. It just went downhill after Christmas and New Year. And I think the fans were like, hang on, we've just won a European trophy. We're currently sixth in the Premier League. We've just beaten Arsenal and Man United. We're going into a new year. We've got a great opportunity to qualify for Europe again. We're into the quarterfinals of the Europa League. Like, let's push on. And instead, we're getting battered by Palace 5-2. We're, we're battered mm. by Fulham 5-0. Uh, go to Chelsea, lose that 5-0. Go home to Arsenal, lose that 6-0. And suddenly, we've gone from a team that was very difficult to, to beat for three years to being thrashed and just knocked about every single week. And the fans were just getting frustrated. It was like, hang on, that European win was supposed to be, you know, the platform to push on. And at the beginning of the season, it looked like we were doing it. And it all just fell apart. And I think that's when the fans just went, oh, enough's enough now. Like, you know, thanks, Dave. You've taken us as far as you can, but it's not really working anymore. And the style of play was an issue. Um, but, you know, a lot of fans that didn't want him to go will go, yeah, well, it worked, didn't it? It was like, well, it worked for a time. But then it stopped working. And at what point do you go, okay, well, you know, time probably to go in a different direction now. He's built the foundations for the club to now push on and bridge that gap that we spoke about earlier. Let's bring someone in that can play a little bit of a better style of football and still get the results. Um, but then you get the be careful what you wish for brigade um, <laughs> who, who clearly only believe that David Moyes is the only man in the world that can deliver success at West Ham United. Um mm. There has to be a manager out there that can play good football and get success. It happens at other clubs. So why can't it happen mm. at West Ham? Um, but for some reason, a lot of fans were like, well, how dare you even dream of having a better manager than David Moyes? <laughs> um, I love the man. Uh, I absolutely love him. But it was time for him to go. And I I, I still believe that now. There's a lot of fans calling for him to come back for a third stint. It's like, well, yeah, what's the point? Like, yeah. you know, we can't keep doing that. Um, you know, We have to go in a different direction now. But he will he will go down as a legend at the football club in my eyes, um, and I understand why the neutral scratching their heads can. Why would they want him to go? Well, you know, if you look at our form, we won three Premier League games after the New Year last year, relegation yeah. form. If it wasn't for our good starts of the season, we would have got relegated last year. So that says all you really need to know about the situation. I think. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's it's well, it's all well and good for other fans to sit here and say what you're doing, what you're thinking of. You know, you don't know how lucky you are. Blah blah blah, all that sort of stuff. We we had similar stuff with, with Steve Bruce as well. Uh, I think yeah. these these managers have got a lot of um, media friends as well. You know, and I, I think David Moyes is a good guy. Like he, he comes across really well when he talks now as well. And he's obviously he's a better manager than what his Man United um, experience was in Sunderland as well. Things didn't go yeah. well from there, but you know. I, when you were talking about winning one trophy, I felt a bit emotional because that's all I want in my whole life. I want Newcastle to win one trophy, and and whoever yeah. manages to do that will be a legend forever. So <laughs> I it's amazing. Feel that. It's amazing. I'm sure it will happen for Newcastle, but I mean, I was there in the stadium in Prague, and um, I cried a lot. Yeah, because I was like, I cannot believe I'm witnessing this. I, I just don't even understand what the hell's going on there. I'm in Prague, which is a great city to be out in anyway. Um, and I've just watched my team win a trophy. And I'm just literally, you know, if I died now, I'd be a very, very happy man. Yeah. yeah. And it was Moise's first trophy, wasn't it, as well? He was so yeah. he was jumping. Up. I think his dad came on the pitch as well. And he had yeah, dad came on the pitch, perfect. wore his medal yeah. for a bit. Yeah, yeah, That's emotional. Amazing. So West Ham had a... We talked about the, they had a big spend in summer and um, widely regarded as doing really good business you know plenty of Newcastle fans were looking at West Ham and saying all these players why can't why haven't we signed Tadebo and all these other players that managed to sign but it hasn't turned out that way yet so Lopetegui's come in uh, used to manage Wolves he had an interesting experience with Real Madrid and the Spanish national team as well yeah. so What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong with this season? Because there's been a lot of change with the you know the squad refresh, but they the seem to make really good, sensible signings in positions that they needed to upgrade. What has gone wrong, and is is it terminal? Because you know that I'm what I'm seeing is that some fans are saying this is you know this is it. he's had 10, 11 games, but it's not going to get better, and he, he's got to go. Is that where are you standing on this? Well, up up until about three weeks ago, I was like, no, too early too early give him time give him time um and then we went to not the forest and lost three nil and for me that was like I, i'm running out of excuses here for <laughs> um and i i just I, i'm seeing no signs um 
that he will turn it around. And I don't think that's anything to do with the, the, the signings that we've made. There isn't a single player, barring one in Guido Rodriguez, that I've seen play and gone, he is woeful. Like, he's terrible. Tadebo is an absolute Rolls Royce of a centre half. Mm. Almost too relaxed for my liking, but he's a very good centre half, just very, very chilled out on the ball. Um, Kilman, you know, everyone knows what you expect with Kilman. Like, you know, yeah. very, very good centre half. He's been brilliant. Wambasak is Wambasak up. Um, you know, Fulkrug's been injured, but, you know, everyone goes, it's, it, you know, it's one of the worst signings in West Ham's history. It's like, well, you know, it's not because he's rubbish, it's because he just got injured. Like, you can't really blame that on his quality or the quality of the signing. Um, so the signings have been good. Um, it's just the tactics, I think. It's just He's trying to play a style of football that the players don't fit in terms of the, mm. their, their qualities. You know, he's trying to play... A, a, he's trying to play wan as like a, a, an offensive wing-back when wan strengths are his defensive qualities. Mm. You know, he, he's widely regarded as one of the best one-on-one -on -one defenders, you know, in the Premier League. And you, nine times, it, almost every game is caught out of position because he's been asked to bum up the pitch or drift inside. And, you know, and it's a bit like, this isn't working, Julian. You, know, you need to change it. Mm. And he hasn't really been changing it. And then when he does change it, he completely changes the formation, doesn't play the same starting 11 um, twice. So it's clear he doesn't really know what his best starting 11 is. Um, and it's just been a little bit of a, Bit of a mess, really. Like no one really knows what his philosophy is or what his tactics are. Um, other than he likes playing Wamasaka very, 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 very advanced. Um, and it's yeah, it's just there's no identity there anymore. Like everyone knew what to expect from West Ham under Moyes, whether we liked it or not, whether we liked the style or the identity, everyone knew what to expect. We don't even know what to expect under Lopetegui at West Ham, let alone the opposition. And I think that's why we've been thrashed quite a lot already this season is that, you know, it's just nothing there really. Um, but the quality of the player is there. Like if you look at our, our yeah. squad on paper, it's brilliant. It's really good, strong. But the tactics uh, aren't there. It's not right. Um, so, yeah, that's where I think it's going wrong. And that's why I don't think he's going to last much longer. Um, and if I was David Sullivan in the club, I would have sacked him before the international break. Because you've got Newcastle away next, and then we've got Arsenal at home the following week. Um, so the chances are he's gonna, we're still gonna, he's still only gonna have what, three wins in fourteen games. So you know, I don't know. I just don't think he's gonna, he's gonna turn it around now. I think too much has happened. Um, but before, through, before the Forest game, I was like, give him time, give him time. But you can't mm. go to Nottingham Forest. I don't care how good they've been this season, or how good much great form, and well Chris Wood's playing. You can't go to Nottingham <laughs> Forest and lose 3-0 with the, with the likes of Lucas Piquetta and Jared Bowen and yeah. Tadebo and Kilman in your team. It just shouldn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'd like him to be sacked, I think. What is communication like as well? Because I think often fans will... Um, they'll be happier with a manager if he's a good person and if he seems like he's if he's got that sort of good communication style where he can get across to the fans or try and explain what he's doing or if he comes across well how has he been with that because that's that can make a big difference well it's, it's a good point um and now think about it you know he hasn't really you know there isn't a really relationship building there um you know he hasn't really done much to you know adhere to the fans and kind of you know warm to the fans a little bit um you know he said all the right things in his first ever interview with the club and when he was first appointed and you know, said he was going to drive the team forward and build on the success and um sign some great players which he did um but beyond that it's nothing's really this hasn't been all we keep hearing from him is that we need to be better and we need to be more consistent and a lot of the fans are going well you know that starts with you being more consistent with your team selection because it's not consistent um in your tactics, which isn't consistent. So there isn't really a relationship there. there. There are a lot of fans that just don't feel close to him. You know, whether you liked more as you didn't, you, you still felt an element of a relationship with him. Mm. Um, we just don't feel that with Lopetegui. Yes, it's still very, very soon in his in his appointment. So you know, that could change. But he's he's gone from being quite likeable in his first couple of interviews in the summer to kind of almost... It's kind of not so much not likable. I wouldn't go that far, um, but kind of unrelatable is probably the best term I can I can mm. I can say. 
and it's interesting when you look at his CV. Like I said before, Real Madrid and and Spain. He was the Spanish national team manager, so he's clearly got something that is attractive to to owners. You know, um, yeah. And he's, he's he's got something about. I mean, where was he before Real? Where was it built out? He was at Seville, uh, Sevilla for yeah. three years and finished in the top. He won the Europa League, um, which, to be fair, at Sevilla is pretty easy. They win it every Everyone year. Everyone does that. <laughs> um, but he won them. He, I think he finished uh, fourth three years consecutively. So he got them in the Champions League four years in a row, or three years in a row. Um, and then, obviously, he took the Spain job. Was unbeaten at Spain before then the whole Real Madrid thing happened and he got sacked mm. the day before the World Cup. And, um, it didn't work for him at Real Madrid, but... I mean, just all that means is that he's not an elite manager because yeah. only elite managers work at Real Madrid. Like, it's, you know, and some of them don't as well. Yeah, yeah, and you, that's fine. He hasn't worked at Real Madrid. It doesn't make him a bad manager. The fact is, he, he's a good manager. He went into Wolves when they were bottom of the league at Christmas and well, yeah. I think they finished 13th that year. And he only left there because he was promised funds and then they, the owners went mm. back on their word and he he like just went, well, I'm out then. Um, and so when we appointed him, I said... On reflection, okay, it's not the type of manager we were expecting. We were expecting, you know, someone a little bit, maybe a little bit younger, a little bit more, someone with a, a, a reputation of playing more attacking football. He hasn't got that reputation. Um, but fine, his CV speaks for itself. He's won a Europa League. You know, he's he's got severe into the Champions League three years running. He kept Wolves up on a shoestring. Um, he's, Real Madrid thought he was good enough to be their manager, mm. so they appointed him. So he's got to be good. Uh, it just hasn't worked, and I think, like I said at the right at the beginning, that's fine. Doesn't you know? If, not every single managerial appointment at any club works. It's just the way it is for me. Mm. Talking about managers getting um, connections with supporters, Alan Pardew, he's someone that has managed both clubs. Yep, he was. Um, it, it, Newcastle fans struggled to warm to him. I think maybe because his, his character, he was a bit brash, you know, and he, he had that sort of like. The arrogance about him, which didn't go down well. Um, but you know, on reflection, he did quite well for us, you know. Um, so and we've had Steve Bruce, who was a Geordie, who we couldn't stand him just because of the way his the football was bad, but also he just didn't have that connection, he just didn't get it, you know, which was interesting. Eddie Howe does, and Eddie Howe says the right things, and he's obviously brought us some success. So there really is a lot to be said, I think, for having a manager who you can really get behind, and it, it yeah. changes the whole atmosphere, doesn't it, at the club. Yeah, I, Adam Pardew. I mean, he he got us promoted, got us to the FA Cup final. Um, uh, Nearly won the uh, FA Cup, Stephen Gerrard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the most painful days for me that. Um, mm. But um, yeah, he's a great manager for us. He was on the radio recently saying he'd love to come back and manage West Ham. He, he'd come back and replace Lopper Take. It was like, oh, shut up, Alan. No <laughs> chance, mate. Um, Box office. But, <laughs> but yeah, but he was yeah he was likable though you know we we did like Alan Pardew he was yeah he was um, he was aggressive and you know again said all the right thing I suppose it also comes with like, the success that, that the manager has as well and that kind of automatically makes them a little bit more likable because yeah. you know they're winning football matches um, I think the two do go hand in hand in some ways but but yeah. Um, I, I, as long as it's not Alan Pardew next, I don't mind. <laughs> Sam Aldice is looking for work. He can come back. <laughs> God, no, definitely not big Sam. We, we've shared quite a lot of managers, haven't we? Over the years? We have. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn Roder as well. Did Glenn Roder manage? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he yeah. Managed, Glenn yeah, Roder was yeah, big. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, he was 2007. He managed us. Yeah, he's a, yeah. he played for us as well. So he was a really popular figure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so recent games between these clubs, they've generally been in our favour. Um, West Ham have won one of the last eight games. We've won four and there's been three draws. For us, there's the 5-1 at the London Stadium, which kind of didn't come from nowhere, but we, we weren't expecting to win that game so heavily at the London Stadium a few years, a few seasons ago. I'm sorry to bring this up, but Easter as well, last Easter this year um, at St. James's Park. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It was it was a 10 p.m. kickoff on Easter Saturday, I think, for us. So we'd um, we'd been having a few drinks here in Australia, um, and that was a pretty special moment for us when Harvey Barnes' goal went in. But that was just a that was what I was talking about before these games, where we've seen probably the worst of West Ham under David Moyes, where there's just been collapses like that, like kind of inexplicable because 
West Ham were really good in the first half of that game. Um, there was another game at yeah. St. James's Park where you absolutely took us to the cleaners and I think it was 3-1 or 3-2, but it was a really good counter-attacking performance by West Ham. So do any of these games stand out for you when you think about West Ham v Newcastle or Newcastle v West Ham? And do you think we might be in for another goal fest um, next week? Well, I think recently, uh, at just St. James's Park, they've been there's been a lot of goals in those fixtures. Um I mean, last year, the whole the one you mentioned, the four the four three. Uh, I still to this day have no idea how that was given as a penalty. I still don't know. Um, it was Calvin Phillips, about wasn't it? it? Yeah, yeah. I'm still angry about. It. I mean, how how can Calvin Phillips be deemed to have fouled Anthony Gordon when Anthony Gordon's behind him? Um, <laughs> like, it just it doesn't just make any sense. Him. It just doesn't make yeah. any sense. Um, but but yeah, I mean, we shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. We should we should have seen the game out. The game should have been done and dusted. Um, I seem to remember was it the first game of the season we won 4 2 one, one season? Yeah, that's Andrews what I was talking Park. about. Yeah, yeah, and you, you were, you were one new up after a minute. Callum Wilson obviously scored because yeah. he always scores against us. Um, so yeah, like there's always I think it was a 3 2 one year and a 2 2 the other year. So there's always goals at St. James Park in this game. Um, yeah, this year. There, there probably will be lots of goals, but they probably all will be for Newcastle. To be fair, the way we're defending, but um, but yeah, I, I, barring those couple of wins that we've had at St James's Park in the recent recent years, um, I've always feared going there. I've always just seen St. Newcastle away as well. That's a defeat. You know, we could have both been battling relegation and just go, yeah, well, we just don't win at St James's Park. That's kind of changed recently. We've been a little bit better, but. Um, I have no hope for Monday night, let's put it that way. Even going back longer, I used to have a season ticket in 2001. Uh, there was a 4-0 win for us the first game of the season. And Lamana Lualua scored a few goals in that game. Um, and then there was another one I was thinking. Oh, there was one where Leon Best scored a hat-trick as well. I was about <laughs> to say that one. That was, that was on New Year's Day. <laughs> yeah, New Year's Day. Yeah. And you know things are bad, but Leon Best is scoring a hat-trick against you. To be yeah, that was, uh, that was a strange game. But, um, but Kevin Nolan's another player we've got. You know, we've both got positive thoughts about Kevin Nolan, Andy Carroll, of course, as well. So there's definitely been some um, some players shared between the clubs. Yeah. This game, you've talked a bit there about Lopetegui's tactics. Uh, you don't probably know, don't know what the team's going to be or what the tactics are going to be other than wan Sacker will be pushing high on the right-hand side. If West Ham are going to hurt Newcastle and if they're going to they're gonna hurt us tactically or what's West Ham's best chances of scoring goals in this game? Or, uh, you know, how? what would Eddie Howe be looking at and thinking they're a threat and this this could be difficult to deal with? I think we're still a threat on the counter. Um, you know, for, for all the goals we've conceded, we've still scored quite a few this uh, this season. Um, so we, we are good on the counter. Um, and, you know, the, our main problem is that when we get into the final third, we, we, we do bottle it a little bit. Um, so the counter attack style still suits us down the ground because it's almost like we've got time to think about it. You know, you just charge up the pitch and, and have a go. Um, whereas if we're sort of building up play and allowed to have the ball a little bit, and we ha- we, we struggle to break teams down um, as well as we should do when you look at the creativity we've got in the squad. Um, so that's probably where, I, if I was Eddie Howe, I'd be looking at going. You know, we're going to have a lot more of the ball. They'll probably let us have a lot more of the ball. Um, so we need to 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 be careful of that counter. Um, the bonus is, is that Kudus isn't playing, um, suspended mm. still, um, bizarrely, for, you know, given an additional two games for that red card at, at Tottenham. Um, I don't, don't know why they gave him another two games, but you know, that's the FA for you. Um, but uh, with Bowen, Antonio's pace, uh, and Somerville now, who's been wonderful, a uh, breath of fresh air, he's been, we've got that pace going forward. Um, but it's the midfield as well. You know, if I'm Eddie Howe, I'm going right, well, I'm just going to exploit that midfield because you know, Guido Rodriguez, who will probably start, um, is playing at La Liga pace still, um, even though he's now in the Premier League. I don't think he's quite realised. Um, and uh, Edson Alvarez, let's just make him make rash tackles because he's been sent off twice this season for making silly tackles. So exploit our our very dysfunctional and uh, unbalanced midfield and protect yourself against the counter attack and you should have absolutely no problems whatsoever and um yeah just attack down that left because Aaron, Aaron Rambasaka will be nowhere to be seen 
Yeah, because we we're not we're not the best when we've got when the onus is on us to do something with the ball. So that's that maybe you know we we struggle to break teams down. We've only scored thirteen goals this season. I think we scored three against Forest, but we were counter attacking in that game. Yeah. So it, I think if we can break through early, then it might be a good day for us. But if not, I think it could be one of those frustrating ones where. You know, we we struggle, and then the fan, you know, the crowd starts to get a little bit agitated. Um, so I think see what happens. I think that you mentioned that Harvey Barnes goal last season. That's how you that's how you beat us on the break. Mm. Thread Harvey Barnes through, or someone similar. Um, he's now growing quite fond of scoring against us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, feed it through to Harvey Barnes, and he'll score. I think Harvey Barnes is a wonderful player. I'm gutted we didn't sign him. Um, because we were linked with him the summer he, he signed for you, and I'm glad we didn't get him. Um, but yeah, he, yeah, because of his pace, we won't know how to deal with that. And he, he might not even, he might not even start because Anthony Gordon has been so good for us, and it's a bit, it's, it's not clear who's going to play on the left for us because it's Bar- Barnes and Gordon both like that position the best. But Joe Linton's been there recently, and that he's been good there as well because we've got Joe Willock back in the midfield yeah. as well. So. Well, yeah. Anthony Gordon will, will have a field day as well, I'm sure. And they'll be on a high after getting his first thing and go in the week. So yeah. um, he he will be buzzing up against um, Emerson at left back or even if he's on the other side at, at Rambasaka at right back. I mean, he won't, he won't even be up against Rambasaka. Rambasaka will be out of position probably. Um, so, yeah, uh, you should have a field day really against our defence. It's just whether you decide to play with the ball or let us play with it and get us on the counter. Hmm. See what happens. Be an interesting game. Have you got a have you got a prediction for this game? I'm guessing you think Newcastle are going to win. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I do think Newcastle are going to win. Um, but I'm I'm going to try and remain positive um, because I do. As, although I think he'll get sacked, I, I do want Lobotegi to to do well. I don't think anyone really wants him to do badly. There probably are some fans that want him, want us to lose, so it's closer to him getting sacked. I don't think like that. I I would rather him be a success, and I want to see him be a success. Um, and I think a point would represent a good result for us, given the situation we're in. Um, so I'm going to say two two, lots of goals, um, but we're gonna we're gonna get a point at St James's Park, um, and then all the goals that we should have conceded but didn't, we'll concede against Arsenal the following week. <laughs> well. If it's 2 2, we'll clip this up and put it on Twitter for you so you can have that one. I think um, it's we we lost to Brighton at home, uh, which was we should have scored early in that game. And if we had, I think we would have run away with it. So I think it all hinges on if we can get an early goal. If we do, I think it might be a good day for us and it might be 3 0, 3 1 maybe. And um, if not, I could easily see a draw. Um, we haven't conceded a lot of goals, so maybe a 1 1. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that we'll have the confidence from the last the last win, and we've got people like Lewis Hall in form as well, who will be on a high from his England exploits. So, yeah, see what happens, James. Thank you very much for your time. Very much appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. Been a pleasure. No worries. We'll catch up again soon. Take it easy. See ya.